It is incredible how the brilliant minds of all the countries, as if laid with rust, can put up with the lame excuses made, or trust the explanations offered that this horrid race for more atomic wear is run to stop the other side from war, by using the threat of superior force to act as a deterrent for the foe. Time after time the same outdated plea is dinned into the ears of anxious folk, to soften anger or allay their fear, while arms and ammunition grow apace. Right from the time when this profane device was used in Japan, the infernal plot has e'er been wrapped in mystery profound. It ne'er has seen the light of day, except for fragments which here or there somehow leaked. The world in general is still in the dark that mankind can be ended in a day and the earth made a desert overnight. The masses, e'en in the most forward lands, have but a hazy notion of this threat. And in the poorer countries, oh my God, except a few, the bulk knows not a jot. So these infernal engines grow apace, while three-fourths of mankind is wrapped in sleep, has no idea to so near to death, no notion that a most malignant plague that can devour the whole race may break out on any day to swallow everyone, or that a hundred million thunderbolts may strike at crowded spots to smash to bits millions of homes with all the folk inside. They know not, O ye brave upholders of the right of man, that there is such a thing as nuclear missile, which can kill at once a million people and destroy a town. And tis these innocents, almighty God, who will be murdered with the nuclear bolts. There are now countless groups of earnest souls intensely occupied with this one task, how to prevent the deepening crisis from resulting in a nuclear holocaust, how to create a daily mounting tide of protests from peace lovers of all lands, to press the men in power and ruling heads of superpowers to ban atomic arms. There is no task so urgent as this one, when looked at from a prudent point of view, for what can all our sweating toil avail? What good can come out of all we have done for centuries to make the earth a heaven of joy and beauty, filled with every need and lavish luxury of every kind, when but a few hours of atomic fire can ruthlessly reduce it all to ash. Tis unbelievable how, with this threat of death, now staring in the face of all, a death so horrible that it defies all efforts to portray its agonies, the world should go on with its daily chores, with its amusements and its pleasantries, as if there is nothing wrong anywhere and all is okay on the Western Front. Nothing to fret about, no one to fear, all nice and smooth, the nation safe and sound, a most unhealthy and unnatural frame of mind in such a serious crisis which can be the grim beginning of the end, the one cause of extinction of the race, of suffering, grief, privation, loss and pain, no skill can paint, no language can describe. This is the blooming spring of talent, wit, and art, the apex of our knowledge of the world, the zenith of inventive skill, the peak of luxury, abundance, wealth, the heyday of enjoyment, orgies, thrills, in short, the prime of pleasure-loving lives. Why in this happy Eden should arise a monster born of flowering science? to hang like to a fearsome specter o'er the earth and cause acute suspense, distress, and fear to those who know what evil it portends. Why in this glamorous age, with minds distraught, should we be made to watch the give and take of two predominant nations angling for support from other people of the earth to fight a bloody duel in which none will be victorious? None sustain defeat. None will survive the war unto the end, and neither ever know who won or lost. 
This book records a commentary in a higher plane of pure intelligence on how the present world appears when seen divested of the gaudy coat of paint applied by man's inherent urge for show to hide his frailties from the searching eye of his immortal soul, to trick himself into believing what he does is right. This state of grace, attained by the devout who consecrate themselves, both heart and soul, to the eternal quest of probing deep the awesome mystery of life and death, permits the surface mind, at intervals, to peer behind the heaving sea of life, at the stupendous ocean, out of which the soul emerges like a bubble, for a while to laugh and grieve upon the stage of earth, till it throws off the mortal coil, no more to be seen in the abandoned dress, no more to love or be loved in the flesh, to taste its ecstasies and agonies. Lost in the vastness of the ocean of terrestrial consciousness, the source of life on earth, but a drop in the cosmic main.